Hi there, it's the Common Magician. I haven't uploaded in a while, um, so I'd give you a, another a discussion here. We're going to call this discussion Cause and Effect. Now, the nice thing about having a YouTube channel uh, where uh, you share things is that people are able to comment uh, on what you share and offer uh, criticisms uh, where necessary, and uh, that is that allows us to open up a dialogue or a conversation about uh, certain concerns that uh, uh, people may have. Um, and I want to address a particular conversation I had recently on a uh, an upload that was dealing with uh, a uh, the idea of cause having a cause in a presentation, and I, I figured I would take a moment to talk about this a little bit. Um, I want to just first differentiate that there's a difference between cause and motivation. I've talked in the past about motivation, uh, and I've asserted that you need to have motivation for what you're doing. Um, the, the difference is that motivation is dealing with the physical movements or the actions that you're taking, that whatever you're doing needs to be motivated. Uh, you shouldn't be doing something for no reason whatsoever, uh, that if you're picking something up, you need to have a reason for it. If you're putting it down, if you're writing something down, if you're taking information, you're doing it for a reason, um, that you don't want to do something for no reason because what that will do is it will tip off the method. Um, doing something for no reason at all uh, is almost always a clear indication of some aspect of method. So you want to have reasons for what you're doing, particularly those things are related to the method. So, I mean, one example of this would be that uh, I have a deck of cards here, uh, and I, I may uh, pick up the deck uh, and to show a coin underneath, right? Uh, I have a, a Morgan Silver Dollar here. Now, the real reason why I pick up the coin, though, is not merely to show the coin, right? It's not merely to just demonstrate that I had a coin sitting under it. The real reason why I pick it up was to load the second coin so that I can uh, uh, perform the effect. Um, so in demonstrating something and showing something, uh, I'm actually motivated to do something that I need to do. So I'm doing something that I must do for the, the cause of presentation and picking up the deck. But I'm actually motivated to do that for a logical reason to show, but I'm also loading at the same time. I have, uh, I have a motivation for my movement. I would not want to do something for no reason. For example... Um, I could uh, try to do the same thing, right, to lift up the deck to show that there's nothing underneath it, right, and then try to load it uh, at the same time. This is bad motivation. I have no reason to show that there's nothing underneath it uh, because obviously it would be assumed that there'd be nothing underneath the deck of cards. I need to show that there's something there. And that motivation to show that something is there is cover for what I must do, which is load the next thing, right? This is just a cups and balls 101, okay? So that's what we're talking about when we say motivation. Cause is something else, though. Uh, when we're talking about cause, I think what we're referring to is one of two things. We're either referring to the reason for doing a demonstration. What is my cause for showing you something? Uh, what relationship is evident there uh, between you and me, or what is the context in our encounter that would cause me to demonstrate something in particular? That is one application of the word cause. Another application of the word cause is what is the factor that is uh, actually causing the effect to occur? What is the cause of the effect? If I am doing a, a presentation, what is my claim that I am making as to why the effect happened? Uh, if I am a, uh, uh, a gambling, you know, if I demonstrate gambling techniques, someone like um, Stephen Forty or uh, um, John Scarney back in the day, you know, people who would demonstrate gambling uh, cheating techniques, that is their cause. The, the cause of the effect that they're showing is card control. That's their cause. If I am a mentalist in the purest sense, if I'm doing mentalism, I'm practicing mentalism as a practicing show mentalist, my cause is something that may be either supernatural or, um, I don't know, metaphysical in some way. There's some kind of uh, a mental uh, ESP sort of connection, extrasensory uh, cause to what I'm doing. And if I'm consistent, I would I would claim that as my cause. So these are these are some examples of cause. 
Um, another e example might be just in terms of a demonstration here uh, that I could uh, have the deck, and we'll, we'll cut it here real quick. I have the deck here, and I could claim that uh, I can sense the identity of cards, any card, by their weight and by their flexibility, because the ink, the ink on the card, uh, actually has a particular kind of uh, a density to it. So red ink is a little bit more soft than the black ink. The black ink is a little bit more dense. And I can feel from this that there seems to be black ink on the uh, pips in there, on the little icons that are on there, the little uh, uh, little figures. And I can almost count them, that there seems to be five on this one, this feels like it's the black ink, and they feel pretty sharp to me. So I think it's the five of spades, right? Uh, I have a cause because I'm making a claim. I'm saying that I can sense ink on a card. That's my cause. Um, likewise, I could do an effect that has no cause at all. Uh, just very technical. I'm not claiming card control. I'm not claiming any kind of extrasensory uh, uh, advancement. Uh, what I am doing is I'm just doing a feat for you, right? And everyone knows, for example, that uh, in in a uh, uh, elementary card magic, you learn one of the first principles is that of the um, uh, key card, right? So you have a key card, which would be in this case the nine of hearts, right? And then I would know my key card, and then I could have someone select a card, and then I would have it returned freely back to the deck underneath my key card, and then I would be able to find it, right? That would be a demonstration that has no cause. Now, you know this, and since you know that that's how the trick works, I can really muddy this up by just by shuffling the deck. If the deck is shuffled, there would be no way to do that exact same method. In fact, there'd be no way to go through the motions of showing that particular trick, having a card selected just like this, where you know the identity, and then perhaps having the card returned exactly to the same place. Now, the only thing I know is that it's in the middle, but I have no reference. I have no key. I have no method to get there, right? Especially if the deck was, like, cut maybe a few times. I would really not know what's going on and where it's at. But yet somehow, uh, without any sort of cause, I would still be able to maybe identify uh, what your card is, uh, the King of Diamonds, right? I just demonstrated something that has no cause whatsoever. Uh, all of the cause that you know in there, all of the methodology has been thrown away. And I used your knowledge of simple uh, magic tricks against you to uh, perform uh, an effect. So um, no cause at all. It's just a feat. Uh, now, this can fry people uh, just like anything that has cause. And we're going to talk about why that may or may not be and why the claim that everything must have cause is not necessarily true. And we'll also talk about why things must have cause, why what you're doing must have a cause to it, may be true in many uh, circumstances and when and, wh and when and where that will apply. Before we go any further, let's get uh, the uh, business out of the way here. The first two effects that I showed you are uh, things that you've, you actually know. In fact, uh, one of them, if you didn't pick up on it, I was explaining exactly what I was doing. I just was hiding it. Um, the, first, the first one, uh, identifying a card uh, based on its weight and its feel uh, and the density of ink, is a peak. It's a, a bend peak. Uh, when you are bending the card to uh, determine what type of ink it is, uh, you can see the index right here uh, from a very sharp angle. So I could identify this as the nine of clubs. Even though it does not look like I can see it, the spectator can see it, it looks like it's facing away from me, I can catch a quick glimpse of that. Works better with a, uh, regular uh, indices. These are jumbo uh, ind indices. I actually found these, uh, I was up in Vermont where they have Walgreens a lot more than they have in western New York where I live. Uh, and Walgreens does a, a uh, reprint of the stud playing cards. These are on bicycle stock, uh, and uh, they're still selling those uh, at Walgreens. So uh, they're a little bit cheaper than a bicycle deck, too. So I went in and I bought a whole bunch of these when I was uh, up in Vermont recently uh, visiting Walgreens. I went in there and bought uh, a handful of these uh, decks. Uh, most of them were jumbo. Some of them were poker. I didn't really mind. I just I like the, the back design looks really nice. I think it's a really classy looking back design, and it's a good quality stock because it's a, a USPC, um, a United States playing card company uh, a stock, so bicycle stock. Anyway, uh, so that's the first one. You are 
just it's a peak, right? Uh, and uh, hopefully you knew that already. I think it's something we've talked about in the past. The second one that I did uh, was very simple. Uh, I was using a key card. I was doing exactly what I said that I wasn't doing. Uh, and it just goes like this. It's a, and it's actually a good application of a key card. So if you uh, uh, have looked at some of these old methods that you learned when you were very young, some of you may be very young, um, you, you should know that all the methods you learned as a kid are still good. They're good methods, even though they may be easy. Oftentimes the easiest methods uh, can hit the hardest. You just have to you have to employ them in a more covert way. So in this case, I took the time to explain that um, you can use a key card, and I show you the key card, and in my explanation, what I'm doing is I'm actually picking up a new key card. My key card is actually going to be the top card, which in this case is the Nine of Clubs. Now, I noticed that when I did it for you, uh, my key card ended up being the Five of Spades, and it happened to be the same card that I used in the first demonstration. That was a total coincidence. It just happened, just so happened to be that uh, when I shuffled, uh, the uh, it got to the top of the deck again. But Nine of Clubs is my real key card, but I'm, I'm indicating that this one is here. Um, what I do is after my explanation of key cards, I say, I tell you a truth with a little bit of a lie. I tell you that if I shuffle the deck, uh, that that would remove any possibility of using a key card because I wouldn't know the identity of uh, the adjacent cards in the deck. And that it would be true if I didn't already peek the top card, but I did pick the top card, and what I did is in my shuffle, as I was explaining what I was doing, I had thumbed off that top card and placed it on the bottom. So my nine of clubs is now my key card, and I know that it's there. So what I can then do is I can say it would be impossible then for me to go through the motions of having a card selected uh, and then return to the deck. And you can look at this card and see that it's a, a, a six of hearts. Now what I do is when I return, I reverse my spread. So what I did is I separated in the middle. This was the top and this was the bottom. Now whenever I bring the card back, I'm going to reverse the spread and make now this the middle of the deck. And this was the bottom of the deck with my actual key card on it, my nine of clubs. And now I've made it the center. So uh, I very sneakily have really cut the deck and I've put your card next to uh, my new key card. And then at this point, the trick is done. Uh, you could cut the deck a few times to explain that I would now not know where it's at, that I could lose the order of it. But ultimately, when I look at you can also do a single overhand shuffle will work well with that. But now what I can do is I can just find my key card, and I know that your card is the one that's right underneath it. So um, I am disguising my method uh, in my explanation. Nonetheless, there is no cause in that. There's no cause in that feat. Uh, and I find that actually when you're trying to fool magicians, uh, there is, you, you, you do best when there's no cause. That magicians don't um, subscribe to cause. They subscribe only to methods. Uh, so that's one particular instance that I have to say to that criticism about cause, where cause is completely irrelevant uh, and in fact, if you fool a magician, if you fool someone who's in on the vocabulary of, of uh, magic, um, you, you actually pull off the, the, the hardest hitting moment of foolery, right? Because uh, they are supposed to know how things work. And if you get them, you, you really get someone good. So that's an example. That's just one example where you can hit really hard without cause. In fact, it may even be necessary to avoid cause altogether uh, in that kind of circumstance. Now, I'll also say that there are some performers in the past, uh, and some even today, who perform without cause. Um, you could arguably say that someone, uh, a mentalist who uh, is perceived as a mentalist and even billed as a mentalist, uh, someone like Darren Brown, has no cause. And the reason why he has no cause is because even though he's billed as a mentalist, he's also a known uh, skeptic. Uh, he does not subscribe to the tenets of mentalism, that he can read minds or do anything. He very explicitly says that he has no ability. Um, therefore, everything that he does really is just uh, a demonstration, a feat. It's uh, a, a demonstration or a trick, and it's, it's known as a trick, known to be a trick. There is no cause. Uh, there's no purpose for what he does in doing it. 
uh, in bringing it out other than the enjoyment of seeing the feat occur. And there's also no underlying cause that he claims that uh, uh, makes it happen other than methods, that there is a variety, there are a variety of methods that he uses uh, to uh, make his demonstrations work. So no cause whatsoever. And uh, you can't say that, you know, Darren Brown's performances aren't very hard hitting. They're extremely hard hitting, and there's no cause at all. You go back before him to his predecessors, uh, someone like David Berglas, who I've talked about before, have a bit of a bit of a man crush on. I really, really like his um, history of performing feats, just doing publicity stunts, just feats with no cause, no explanation as to why it should work or how it should work or why it can be done, and also no cause for why he should do it in the first place. He just did this stuff, uh, and it really just fried people because there was no explanation that you could find. The goal was really that it was a puzzle. I'm going to show you a puzzle. It's a puzzle that you can't find the answers to as much as hard as you, you search, uh, and I've, I've gone out of my way to make sure that the possible answers are hidden. Uh, that you can't find them. And that's the game that he played. Another one is Chan Canasta did very similar kinds of presentations where there was no cause. There was no first cause for doing it at all in the first place, and there's no cause that he would claim for how it occurred. He did not claim to read minds. He did not claim any kind of spiritual uh, uh, access uh, to the knowledge that he would portray in his presentations. Um, he would not claim uh, control. Uh, he wouldn't point to methodology at all. He would just do things, uh, and they would astound people. So um, I just wanted to bring that up, that no, no, there is no, there's no reason why you have to have cause, in spite of that um, uh, age-old teaching that there has to be a cause for everything. Well, there needs to be motivation for everything, but there does not necessarily need to be cause. Now, why would you want to operate that way? Because there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to claim a cause uh, for what you're doing. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to claim that uh, something is causing this to happen, either <clears throat> some kind of mental capacity or spiritual uh, uh, movement or uh, some kind of skill control going on. There's no reason why you shouldn't necessarily point to that, except for those times when maybe you shouldn't. Uh, and I'll talk about those in a moment. There are actually times when you should not bother uh, to uh, point to cause, either first cause or a cause for the effect uh, occurring. So before I talk about why you shouldn't uh, point to cause or have cause, uh, for what you're doing, let me first explain those moments when you should. Um, you should have a cause for what you're doing when it's helpful. That's that's it. So if you can give a cause for what you're doing, either a cause for doing it, uh, a kind of conversational cause, such as when you're talking about one thing and that leads to a totally different conversation, right? A segue, a conversational segue. If you can segue into a presentation and give it a reason for doing it and it's beneficial to you, you should do that. There's no reason why you shouldn't do that. That's fine. Doesn't mean that you can't show some somebody something out of the blue. You can't, hey, let me show you something something fantastic, right? You go to the David Blaine street magic model for that. There's no reason for a creepy guy to, to step up to you on the street and show you something um, randomly other than just to amaze you, right? Um, in fact, I'll just say David Blaine is a good example. He never, he very rarely, I'll say that, he very rarely ever gave cause to what he did. Um, he didn't, you know, explain this is what's happening. This is why it's happening. He just did things, um, and you can't say that someone like, you know, whatever you think about David Blaine uh, in his presentational style, you can't say that he wasn't hard hitting. He was very effective and very impactful and had a, a great influence on a lot of people. Um, so, again, you use cause, you, you apply cause to what you're doing when it's beneficial, when it's helpful, when it makes things more smoothly occur. Um, that's when you do it. Uh, doesn't mean that it's necessary, but that's a reason to do it. Um, second reason why you should use cause. If you are billing yourself as a particular kind of performer, then you should be consistent and you should have a cause for that. If you are claiming to be a mentalist, you have a mentalist act, 
and you're claiming that things, you know, that one one effect one place is a spiritual supernatural occurrence, then you probably should claim the thing consistently all the way through, right? As many mentalists will do. Now, there's a difference between a stage mentalist uh, who does a magic act, mentalism act, and a person who claims to be a medium, right? One person is lying very overtly about what they're doing. That would be the, the, men, the, the, the medium kind, right? The person who says, I can tell you things about yourself and about your past and your future that I could not possibly know. Uh, to your benefit, I can help you. I can change your life by telling you these things. I can give you true life insight uh, to uh, what you're doing. These things are unethical. Uh, uh, these people that do that, okay? And that's, you know, I, I, I have a great issue with, with those people that do that kind of thing. On the other side of it is the stage mentalist who makes a very similar claim except that they apply no application. They give no application to a person's life and their situation. It is known to everybody, essentially everybody going in. You'd have to be very mentally deficient, I think, to walk into a mentalism act. Uh, I, I, and I would say that um, I think um, hypnosis is kind of a different category of this because hypnosis is kind of a half-truth, half-lie kind of presentational thing. Uh, the idea of uh, hypnotic suggestion is a true thing, but it's not what people think it is, right? So people can subscribe to it honestly, think believing in it, but they may actually be believing in the wrong thing, and I don't think that's really unethical um, because there's a, again, there's there's a bit of a half truth to it. But the stage mentalist, right? People know that they're using methodology other than what they're claiming, uh, and that's that's just part of the fun. That's part of the game. Uh, when I go to see a mentalist perform a mentalism act, I don't believe, and as I don't think anybody would or should, that they're actually reading minds. Um, that's what they're claiming. That's just part of the fun. Um, so there's a difference between those two things. So you should have cause if you're billing yourself as a particular kind of performer. If you are a card uh, magician that, uh, again, does gambling demonstrations and you're claiming card control, that's your cause. I'm showing you things to demonstrate card control. That's my cause and that is what is accomplishing this. Okay. Now, why you shouldn't point to cause. Gregory Wilson once said, uh, I saw on a video um, uh, demonstration that he did, uh, he was talking about uh, performing styles uh, and uh, how you should approach people and, and, and show things to them. And uh, one, of the, one of the little pieces of information, kind of food for thought that he gave, was that when you're presenting to somebody you should probably present on their mental level, right? That that you you don't necessarily want to go up to someone and say, uh, "Let me tell you a story." There were these uh, four ladies, right? And then pull out four queens and do. Um, the, and the reason why that is may not be beneficial uh, that kind of presentation is because a lot of adults, particularly in you know very adult kind of scenes, don't appreciate that kind of presentation. And the way he put it, and I'm paraphrasing, and I may get the wording a little bit wrong here. He said, someone looks at that kind of presentation, that a claim uh, like that, or, or, or some kind of uh, claim that they don't necessarily believe in or subscribe to. They look at that as child's play. And, uh, you know, the inner monologue they may be having is, hey, that, that's really nice. Okay, I'm going to go over here and talk to the adults now. Okay, that's kind of the way he, he portrayed that sort of presentation. Now, you should not be subscribing cause to your presentations if you're running in circles where people can't possibly appreciate the cause that you're giving. Okay, so let me give you some background for me. I am a, I'm a Christian. I'm a born-again believer. I run in circles of those people. That's my family, my friends. Uh, there ain't no way that I'm going to be giving a demonstration where I'm telling them that I'm reading their mind. Okay? I'm not, that, that is not a cause that is going to work for them. And you may not realize this. I don't know. And I, I'm not preaching to you, by, by the way. I'm not trying to convince you, although I would always convince you to... <laughs> uh, uh, to accept Jesus Christ. But uh, I, I, that's not my goal. 
I'm just saying that the people that I'm with are the are, are the biggest skeptics. You think you may think that uh, skeptics like uh, you know agnostic atheist you know Penn and Teller kind of types, uh, the James Randi, who who I uh, respect a great deal actually for for their work in skepticism. Um, you think they're the hardest skeptics? You know, the, the, the Christians, they're, they're worse. They're, they're much more skeptical uh, for good reason. Uh, and there's actually quite a few, uh, just to point to them historically, that uh, are, are in that field that are very respected magicians. Andre Cole is one of those. Danny Corum is another. Danny Corum uh, worked for a long time exposing um, mediums uh, for that reason. And he born again believer. And he did it because uh, it was, it was uh, a problem. Uh, to the gospel as he saw it. So he, he spent a lot of time doing that. He's now in the field of journalism, I believe, has gotten away from magic a bit. But uh, uh, Andre Cole is another one uh, who's very clear about his gospel message. But he's a great, he's a great inventor and magician and has worked a, a long, long time with uh, a stage illusionists in the creation of effects, did a lot of work for uh, David Copperfield. Uh, a lot of his hardest hitting presentations uh, were creations of Andre Cole. Uh, so there are those people out there. That is why I do not subscribe that cause uh, to my effects. I'm not going to be claiming mentalist capability. I do not run in circles with people who are going to accept that uh, or appreciate that or buy that. Uh, the moment I say something like that is a moment I've lost uh, the, the spectators that I'm performing for. They're not going to listen to it. Um, likewise, I do subscribe a bit to um, uh, that Gregory Wilson criticism about presentation, that I don't want to be acting outside of my um, age level, right, when I'm dealing with adults. I'm going to be a little bit more frank. I would prefer to say, let me show you something interesting, much more in the David Blaine kind of style. I'm doing what I am doing, and that is all I am doing. See if you can sort this out, right? That's the cause and the only cause I need. I have no reason to do anything else. Um, and I don't, need to sub I, I don't need to apply some kind of, uh, you know, kid's story to it to, to, make it to make it work. Now, that being said, there are some story tricks that I do. You know, Sam the Bellhop, something like that. That uh, doesn't necessarily apply cause to it, but it does make a, it does give you for initial cause. There's a reason why I'm showing this. Let me tell you a story, and you'll see how this uh, kind of fits in. What you know, my presentation that I'm showing these cards in this order. So you know, that's a that's an example where cause helps a trick. You can't just say, okay, look, I'm going to go through the deck and I'm going to call out every card as it comes while I'm shuffling it. That's not a good presentation. I need to have a little bit better first cause than that. So my first cause is let me tell you a story so you can tolerate this okay um so that's a, a time when you want to use cause um yeah that's it that's pretty much the discussion so uh the, the criticism came up with a, a, a little mentalist kind of trick uh that i did where i had a uh, a stub a ticket stub in my wallet and i did a little bit of a uh a thing with numbers, freely selected numbers, and we uh, jumbled them up and moved them around. I gave the spectator a few different options to make the outcome different, and then I pull out my ticket stub, and I demonstrate that the numbers that they came to were a perfect match for my ticket stub. Uh, one of the criticisms of that was that, oh, it's clearly a math trick. Well, I don't think so. I think it's obviously based on a math trick, but what we did is we uh, applied in that instance a number of multiple outs so that uh, the spectator had choices, and it wasn't merely, it couldn't possibly have merely been a math trick because the spectator had choices. Some of them were real, some of them were not, uh, but it gave the spectator a very clear sensation that this is random. Uh, and what we're using is we're using the methodology of a math trick to get to a reliable end or, or a narrow set of ends that you can use in a multiple out scenario. So, no. You don't need to have cause for everything. Uh, no, tricks are not weaker without cause. Tricks can be incredibly impactful entirely without cause. And again, I point to greats like um, uh, David Berglas, Chan Canasta, Darren Brown, um, David Blaine, and so many others that uh, just demonstrate fantastic feats for no reason whatsoever, uh, just just as a puzzle for people to sort out and rack their brains over. Um, and that's my style. Those are the people I run with. And that's that's why uh, sometimes I just do things. Um, and that's why it works best in those situations. So a little bit of an explanation for that. Um, 
but to each his own. Uh, you may find that uh, you need, again, to apply a consistent cause to what you're doing, and it, that's great for you. you. You ought to do that if that's what is necessary. So hopefully this was helpful to you. I wish you the best of luck and happy magicking.